Win for Pound for Pound ATL. What's going on, football fans? It's me, J.R. Clark, back again with another rendition of the Pound for Pound Live. Coming at you live, obviously. We're going to switch it up a little bit this time. I got my man Mike Dub over here. Uh, Toby had to be out of town this week, and uh, so we pulled in the uh, the bench. Ben, I guess you could say we went to the bench. I don't know. A bad, bad sports analogy on that one. But anyway... <laughs> We are coming at you live once again on a Tuesday night, like we always do, and we are talking training camp. I mean, we got some stuff to talk about today, Mike. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I guess yes. we could start with the the biggest elephant in the room right out the gate, right out the rip. Uh, we'll talk about the cutting of Jamon Brown. Ooh. That one came as kind of a surprise Kind of not. Now, hmm. I'm going to go ahead and record as saying, because I, I sent out a tweet saying, talking about how I wasn't really a, a big fan of that move to begin with when we signed him. Uh, I tried to make uh, lemonade out of lemons, as we do, and went and started doing some research on him. And, and it sounded like, initially, that he was the uh, better lineman on the Saquon Barkley rookie offensive line. But it sounds like that's saying that he was the least smelliest piece of garbage in the trash can, to use a, a, a bad analogy. The problem that it seemed like he had ne- initially was that was injury issues. And he dealt with that this past year, injury issues and extremely inconsistent play. Uh, so that led to the team deciding to uh, part ways with him. What was your initial thoughts when you when you saw that come across the uh, Twitter feeds? Well, well, I, I think I, I'd have to say surprise, right? Because mm-hmm. let's look at it like this, right? So, so, so my thoughts are this, Jr. It's like if a team is willing to take a cap hit, right? Where it's just it's a dead cap hit, right? Right. I th- I think that that says more about what they thought of his play on the field. I think if anything, I can say about Jamon Brown is that I'm always for a player getting his money, right? Oh, and yeah, I think sure. he was able to do that, right? So I think he was able to come to Atlanta, get the contract. He got, you know, he was able to take a uh, take advantage of a good market. Mm-hmm. I think we hoped for good player. And, and, and here's the thing. I, I won't I won't kick the trash can on Jamon Brown and just say he was horrible because what well, most people, you know, if you, if you blinked twice, you would have missed the fact that he started nine games for us last oh, year. Yeah, right? dude, it was – like between injuries and then the shuffling between him and Carpenter. Right. Um, I felt like in a lot of ways he didn't get necessarily a, a fair shot is hard to, you know, to, to say there that he didn't necessarily get to prove if he was worth the money or not really. Right. But, but okay. So, so let's, let's look at it like this though. Right now, let me ask you this question. Hmm. What does it say to you that a player who was in concussion protocol, right? Mm-hmm. He comes back one day, and the next day he's cut, right? <laughs> well, okay, on the, on the optics side of it, what it says to me is that they saw all they needed to see. I think it was a panic move by Dimitrov to sign Jamon Brown and James Carpenter, especially if he knew that he was going to potentially draft two offensive linemen in the first round like back to back like that, you know? So I really felt like that the James Carpenter and Jamon Brown signing was a band aid to begin with, albeit in an expensive band aid, but a band aid nonetheless, because you know, you're betting on Chris Lindstrom and Caleb McGarry, right? And you figured James Carpenter, Jamon Brown, one of them could have won out the left uh, guard spot and the other one be a reserve. I right. mean, People talk about the money. We didn't necessarily sign them to huge deals. Now, Jamon Brown, if I'm not mistaken, got the larger of the two contracts between him and James Carpenter. But they were both like on the fringes of being backup starter money, you know. Um, so with with that being said, after you saw what you saw from them 
in the uh, 2019 campaign where Matt Ryan got sacked 50 times. You couldn't count on either one of those two dudes. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Matt Gano finished out the season at left guard. Uh, you know, that told me all that I needed to know. It just, it kind of sucks that, that you could have used maybe the, the June 1st designation, you know, and maybe saved yourself some cap money. But I guess if you were making the decision to, you know, cut Trufant, you used it there, you know. But uh, so I guess what this really leads into, the Jamon Brown lack of play really speaks to the level that Matt Hennessy has already come on in a short time in training camp. Absolutely. Now, you Absolutely. were saying something about uh, something that Vaughn McClure treated, tweeted out. Uh yeah, yeah, and, and actually, so so it's funny, right? So uh, about three hours ago, I, I was looking on ESPN, and, and Bob, Bob McClure said basically uh, he was talking to Dirk Cutter today, right? And Dirk Cutter said, uh, you know, hey, we're getting a lot of buzz about Matt Hennessy. The people want to know about Matt Hennessy. What are your thoughts about Matt Hennessy? So Dirk gives the very coach answer. He says, you know, I'll be comfortable with whoever our starting left guard is uh, versus Seattle. <laughs> yeah. because he'll be our starting left guard, right? So very coach answer there, but um, – you know he is a rookie. He's got things to learn. But <laughs> see, okay, I'm glad you you put it like that because that's one of the main reasons why I very rarely like watch a coach interview because mm-hmm. they don't tell you nothing. They don't tell you anything you want to actually know. You know, they're not, he's not gonna come out and say, "Oh well, you know, Matt Hennessy's head and shoulders above everybody else. He's probably gonna be our starting left guard because he <laughs> wants Matt Hennessy to." you know, work for it, not hear that and just actually like, you know, grind for it. Right. So he's got to say, Oh, he's doing good for a rookie. So on and so forth. Um, but I mean, everything that you're seeing from or hearing from the reporters, he's actually is looking outstanding. You know, he's having some of your, you know, your few rookie mistakes. Uh, they seems to be doing better in, um, run blocking versus uh pass blocking but that's because he's an ultra athletic guy absolutely you know so it'll be interesting to see who the starting left guard is i now after after seeing them feel comfortable enough to come up to cut jamon brown i got a really good feeling that it's going to be uh matt hennessy because they have no qualms about starting rookie offensive linemen that much is for sure so, 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 couple, couple great points, great, great points. So let let me let let's just touch a little bit deeper on, on Matt Hennessy for a second, right? Because this is why I think, and great point about run blocking, because I think it's important that we highlight Matt Hennessy's run blocking uh, being a strength out of the gate. Because again, I, I'm a Matt Hennessy geek. I studied mm-hmm. his film. I listen to what the coaches say about him. Um, and if you need it, if there is no better reference of a coach to talk about what it was like to coach Matt Hennessy is actually the current head coach of the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. And that's Jeff Collins, right? So I listened to an interview that Jeff Collins gave about Matt Hennessy. And he was so excited for the pick because what he said is he said, Matt Hennessy is, he was the quarterback of our offense on the offensive line. Right. Sounds like, sounds like another guy. They are sounds like another guy we've got on our offensive line. When you hear the term quarterback and man, like I said, he gets the, he gets to lock, feet with that guy every play one it's almost like you get to go in the trenches with your boss every day it's yep. the greatest on the job training that you'll get anywhere else right so what matt hennessy the thing i like about matt hennessy is that it doesn't surprise me that his run blocking is out the gate but i think where that helps us again because he will be our starting left guard i will i believe it's basically if you read through the two we haven't heard much about james carpenter good or bad which means mm-hmm. james carpenter is a glorified backup right now right but i think right it's going to be Matt Hennessy's ability to get to the second level because he's a little bit more athletic as a guard. Right, right. exactly. So I think, one, it helps us, you know, feel comfortable running the ball because I know, again, we're going to throw the ball a lot, but it does make me comfortable that once we give Todd Gurley those 15 to 25 touches, which I believe is kind of his. We're we, we, we going to get into that here in just a second. And we're going to touch on that in a second, right? Because right? I don't want to – we don't want to get – this is not Todd Gurley time. This is Matt Hennessy. <laughs> I think as we 
as we look at, as we look at, like you said, we look at your, uh, that second level block in the screen game, the outside zone game. Yep. Makes me really excited about our versatility that we have on the offensive line. And again, that's why I keep harping on every episode you listen to us. I will say this year, the offensive line will be a strength. This year, the offensive line will be a strength. There I will go. keep saying it until Say they prove it. Yeah. All right, we're going to jump in and chat here for just a second. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm going to start it up for the folks who said hello already. Man, that was awesome. Uh, Caden, what's going on? Kojak, man, Kojak, come on, dog. You, you're giving us a, a little a $20 tip there, man. I We really appreciate that, Kojak. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we appreciate you uh, uh, joining us the, as much as you do. So we, we thank you there, Kojak. Oh, yes. And uh, he said uh, he seems to be very excited. Kojak seems to be excited that you're in the building there, Mike. Uh, and, and we're going to try to mix it up between, you know, the four of us now. We have we have that opportunity, so now we are going to try to mix it up. Uh, Charlton Nash thinks uh going to comment on uh, Charles Harris overtaking Tack. I think that's something we're going to get into here in a little bit uh, because Dante Fowler seems to be really taking on that mentor role. So that's something I want to get into here in a little bit. So Charlton Nash, we're going we're gonna to circle back around to that here in a little bit. Um He's uh he asked like Jamal Brown cut opened up a roster spot for what position? Well, they did sign some camp body offensive lineman. I can't even remember that gentleman's name. Uh, nothing you. against that guy. I'm I, sure I he's a you. fine fella. I got you. I got you, Jr. I got you, Jr. <laughs> ten seconds. All right, guys. All right, pound for pound family. You get ten seconds. Okay, John Armstrong. Ah, okay, John Armstrong. The lead. There it is. There As it is. a practice squad player. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Okay, you guys yeah, we're moving right. I give them more than 10 seconds. That's what we got. Keep going, uh, JR. Anthony Wright <laughs> says, what's up, JR Mike? What's going on, Anthony? And we're glad you decided to join us again this evening. Oh, Jamon, right. He says, Jamon Brown was a good against the run, but his pass blocking was no good at all. Yeah, no. And and look, here in Atlanta, with Dirt Cutter as your OC, number one priority, keeping MR2 on his feet. That is the That's number right. one priority. Uh, right. Let's see. Jocelyn says, uh, uh, Brandon says hi. So, uh, all right, that's cool. Hey, my, my son is tuned in. So, look, oh, hey, cool. My, okay, well, look, look sharp, man, Mike. Got impressionable eyes watching on you. Hey, 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 hey. Shout out to the little <laughs> pound. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Brandon that's Levy says, uh, uh, P for P A T L. Are they running a zone scheme this year? They keep saying that they're running the zone scheme, but we're gonna get into this when we actually get to the uh, Todd Gurley talk. Uh, they're running a little bit of everything. Uh, but they, they keep trotting out that, that wide zone talk. Uh, Twisted Torch TV says Dante adds a different uh, pass rush element. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Um, yes. Let's see. Yes. Anthony Wright says he agreed with Charlton Nash. Uh, stated this on another gentleman's show. Talking about uh, Harrison or Harris pushing tack. We'll see how all that goes. Um, Twisted Torch says this channel is dope. Appreciate the good content. We, we appreciate you watching. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Fred Butts. Hey, Fred says, uh, what do you think our record record will be? Uh, we're going to think when we get a little closer to the season, we might do the record talk. I'm not a big fan on the record talk, but we, we might jump into that. Uh, let's see. William Paul says McGarry will be much improved and Lindstrom is already a beast in the making. You are correct about that. I think Lindstrom... Oh. Is a beast already. So, so, so let's pause it right there. Yeah, let's pause it right there. So, yeah. I like I like us talking about McGarry, and I like us talking about Lindstrom because here's the thing: might as well go ahead and get it out of the way because if we talked about Matt Hennessy. I think the Hennessy, um, the Hennessy, McGarry, um, Lindstrom, those mm-hmm. three guys, those are going to be the guys of that group because that is the future of our offensive line. Don't oh, don't yeah. get me wrong. Because a couple more years from now, a oh, year or two from now, Jake Matthews will be our Alex Matt right now. Just right, he'll he'll be your elder statesman that we're going to be looking to, uh, you know, potentially, you know, draft a, a grooming person. Uh, absolutely, and, and I think I think why I have to pause on the McGarry Lindstrom connection is again, I believe football teams are at their best when you have the right mix of veteran leadership and youth leadership, right? right. Mm-hmm. And, and you got you got it you got the right side of the line every day. I'm gonna tell you something. It's becoming trivial. Oh, Dan Quinn, what does he say every day in practice? Oh yeah, McGarry and uh, Lindstrom looks good. It's almost trivial when they ask right, him about it. Right. It's like they are, and and as we know as Falcons fans, we watch a lot of Falcons games. When those guys are on the field at the same time, 
we are at our best yeah. at the end of the day, right? So what is what I think is even going to be more motivational to those guys is adding a Matt Hennessy, who I know is a sponge, right? Oh, you know, yeah, definitely. You know, because let's be let's be real. You know, let, let's go there. Let's go there. Twenty four at Lucan, Yale University. Yep. At Hennessy, Temple University. Yep. Those are guys that I hear. You know what I hear about those guys? I hear that you tell them something one time and they got it. That's it. Done. That's it. So, great question. Glad you brought it up. Keep them rolling. Keep them rolling, JR. 10 4. Let's see. Uh, Darius Rain says, Do you guys believe in ROC? Is he the guy or do we need to move on? Okay. I've got a like hate relationship with Dirt Cutter, I guess you could say. What Dirt Cutter is, and this is not necessarily a glowing endorsement, what Dirt Cutter is, is a professional offensive coordinator in the NFL. Right. Now, I say that because we had a guy here for a couple of years who wasn't a professional offensive coordinator. He was an <laughs> offensive coordinator, but Sarkeesian was not a professional offensive coordinator. Not at the NFL level, okay? And and he showed that because he just didn't necessarily have a game plan. One Absolutely. of the biggest problems that I have with Dirk Cutter is at times he can seem way too vanilla. You know, he doesn't seem super creative. Now, obviously the most creative OC we've had in here in a while is obviously Shanahan. But that comes with its own downfalls as well, as Absolutely. you've seen now in two Super Bowls coached by Shanahan, okay? Absolutely. Uh, so – don't don't sit here and think that he's the only way to win. Don't you know? Remember that uh, Dirk Cutter in 2012 took us to the NFC Championship game. Mike Smith and Mike Nolan's defense failed us consistently, you know. But you know we did enough to, offensively to win that game. So I've got faith in Dirk Cutter. I just don't have faith in Dirk Cutter as far as producing a consistent run game that's right you know and so i guess we can go ahead and transition that into the uh comments that have come out today about todd Gurley. you had <coughs> the oc making comments dirt cutter in, a, in an interview with vaughn and you had todd Gurley himself being on a series xm uh radio show with alex marvev Mar Marv, Marv, i am so bad with names anyway um uh, and the thing that come up that seems to be a lot of people be sticking on is a minimum dirt cutter said he wanted to get him a minimum of 15 touches a game with no more than about 25 touches a game. So that's, I mean, that's the numbers that that Freeman had last year, you know, mm. as our lead back. See, the thing that I don't think dirt cutter cares for is a workhorse back, you know, to just fully, strap a saddle to and, and, and ride off into the sunset with. You know what I'm saying? So it is 15 to 25 touches, perfect for a guy like Todd Gurley. I think he averaged 17 touches a year last year in um in L.A. So I think that workload would suit him suit him well, in my opinion. I, 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 think, I'd, I think I'd have to agree with you. And I think, you know, two good points, two good points you made up. I think it is a great reminder that Dirk Cutter was our OC, you know, back in what, 2012, yeah. 2013 mm -hmm. in the NFC Championship. So he has had success not only with the Falcons, but like I said, being in a capacity where, you know, we could have top five, top 10, top 15 offenses, right? And I think right. that was the expectation of when Dirk Cutter came back the second go around after being the head coach at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers was how many points he put up. Because here's my thing about before we touch on Todd Gurley, my thing about Dirk Cutter is this. He took Ryan Fitzmagic, and I just remember, I can never forget the game where Ryan Fitzmagic dropped 48 points on the New Orleans Saints in yep. the Superdome, and it just made me think, well, this guy can do whatever he wants with the offensive pieces that he has. So I think it's important, as we talk about the offensive line, Matt Hennessy is a dirt cutter guy. Oh, dirt yeah. cutter ultimately likes those, that screen <laughs> game, setting up for the, you know, the deep game. And I think, to me, I didn't think James Carpenter or Jamon Brown were more of a fit for what Dirk Cutter wanted out of an offensive line because they're more mauling guys. That's more of right. a power. They're, they're more, more of a power, power scheme. Power scheme guys, right? Yep. And that's something that's funny, you know, going back to the Todd Gurley comments, you know, he talked about, you know, zone running and inside zone and outside zone and power and, you know, power scheme and how all that being in the playbook. 
and that that leads me back to a point I made early in the summer, and it's a point I will probably die on the um, die on the hill with as far as it comes to Dirk Cutter. Dirk Cutter performs best when he has elite talent, yeah. and what Dimitrov, McKay, whoever you want to credit this offensive, you know, stuff behind this year, what they've done is they've given uh, Dirk Cutter plenty of elite talent to work with from Ty Gurley to obviously Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, Laquan Treadwell, Matt Ryan, and then gave him an athletic, smart offensive line to be able to run those screens that he loves to run that he supplements his run game with, you know, he supplements uh, part of his run game is those screens, you know, between, you know, tight end screens, the wide receiver screens, the bubble screens and, and wheel routes and stuff like that. And, and you've heard and you've seen videos of Todd Gurley catching balls coming out of the backfield. You know, right. Brian Hill working on uh, his pass catching because that's something that you've got to do in this offense, period, point blank. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's see here. We're going to go dip back into chat for a few seconds. Okay. Uh, let's see. And Anthony Wright says, Matt Hennessy will be the new starting left guard with James Carpenter as the backup. Yep, that's pretty much what we were saying. And uh, and let's see. I've got a couple of retracted messages. Y'all mess me up when y'all do that. Uh, Jamal Regan says, what's up, uh, Mike and Gerald? What's going on, Jamal? How are you, sir? Uh, Richard uh, Richardson says, we are going to be a physical in the trenches and must show improvement in our run game. Once we establish a run, then our wide receiver core and Matty Ice will do the rest. Yeah, let's, let's touch on that trenches for just a minute. It seems like finally finally after years of begging for it it seems like this front office has finally decided to build trenches with the marlon davidson pick with the the three offensive linemen pick in the past two years you know with signing dante fowler it seems like they're really finally like paying attention to shoring up the trenches and that's something that sir yeah good good teams have you know Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think let's talk about the trenches for a second, right? If we're going to talk about offensive line and defensive line and listen, shout out to you guys at Pound for Pound ATL, because if you guys have us mostly talking offense and we haven't touched on defense yet, that means we grew up with you. So <laughs> shout, shout out to you guys for keeping us on the offensive side of the ball. But it's like right. when you talk about the trenches, hey, now is a great time to talk about the trenches because there are a couple of things here, JR, that we got to touch on that I know are near and dear to your heart. So I'm going to just bring them out. And I right. wanted to wait till we talk. About it, right? So, okay. We talk trenches, right? And I and I believe, you know, you almost got to be like a diabolical scientist a little bit when you talk about the Falcons' defensive line, right? Because here's the thing. What I like is when we talk fast and physical, the Dan Quinn moniker, right? Right. There are a couple of things I like the chemistry of this defensive line because what we tend to forget, you know, is basically that the defensive line, they rotate in and out. So every guy, we talk a lot about the starters. You know, we talk about the Dante Fowlers. We talk oh, about right, Tag. Right. We talk about Grady. We talk about, um, you know, uh, Tyler Davidson because we see those guys the most. But, again, there are some guys that I think behind the scenes that that's what's ultimately going to help us win games as well, right? Because last year, yeah, to be honest with you, I really felt like I could poke at the weaknesses of Adrian Claiborne's game. He did the mm-hmm. best he can, but, but I think there were certain uh, weaknesses that came with his game. Um, same thing with Jack Crawford. Yeah. You know, I think at times – Jack Crawford looked really lost. And then at times, like I said, he did really well. But I think with the mix of talent we have, I think you'll see much more consistency on the defense line. And let me touch on one player really quick that yeah, I, I saw his name flash up. And we do shows about him all, man. We, we've done shows on Charles Harris. You know, we talk about Charles Harris, you know, pushing tech. But there's another guy here that actually – Come on with it. I had, and I really had to dig deep into find his highlights it, that I think that will push is Stephen Means. And I'm going to talk about him for a second. I'll talk about him for a second because here's the thing. We cry about losing Big Beasley. Yes, we like Big Beasley. We could do a whole show on why does Big Beasley love football or doesn't love football. But if there is one guy post ACL, towards ACL, but I know I'm – shout out to the doctors because you can come back a lot quicker from lot an ACL yep. than you used to, it's Stephen Means. And most Falcons fans, they've seen him, and they don't even really know how we got him. So let's let's touch on it for a little bit. Stephen Means last year was one of the last cuts – training camp for the Buffalo, uh, excuse me, not Buffalo, for the Philadelphia Eagles, mm-hmm. right? He went to college. This is for you guys to go back and do your Stephen Means uh, homework. He went to college. 
Uh, and I can't make the comparison, but they have some pretty good defensive ends where he went to college at the University of Buffalo. And there was another defensive lineman in the NFL who went to the University of Buffalo where I'm familiar, familiar with, Mr. Khalil Mack. He is not Khalil Mack. No, but, no, he's not Khalil Mack. But, 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 but he is a speed rusher. He is actually the fastest of our, of our pass rushers. And I think I saw his name pop up a little bit on the, on the wire in terms of, oh, tackle for a loss, big hit by Stephen Means. And I'm like, I want to know more. Yep. I want to get him on, get an interview out of him. Like, does he have a chance to make this team? Because he may be a guy that we don't talk about who could blow up. And I would say at his, at his ceiling, maybe give us four or five sacks that we haven't talked about. Put right. him on your radar. Yep. YouTube is I mean, highlights. You have, you have guys like, you know, we, we, last week we spent a good bit of time talking about the defensive line and there was a lot of names that didn't even come up. I mean, we didn't even touch on Allen Bailey. We didn't even touch on second-year guy who I think is the reason why we didn't re-sign Adrian Claiborne was John Kaminsky because he can him. he can do a lot of things that that you were asking Claiborne to do right. Uh, you know he's a he's a run setter first or an edge setter. You know plays the run more than he does uh, anything else, but he can still get after the passer. I mean, you That's saw right. you saw him do that in the uh, in the preseason, uh, and when he did get his chances towards the end of the uh, season, he got himself a, a I think it was a sack and a, or a half sack or a sack and a half, one of the two. Yeah. I can't remember, but he's a guy I expect to make a good jump. And and you're hearing some, you know, uh, you know, you're hearing his name come up when they mm-hmm. ask coaches about. Uh, who's doing, you know, who's jumping out at him already or who's doing a good job. Uh, Kaminsky's name's coming up. I think between the the rotation that you can send out there and the different combinations that Raheem Morris has at his disposal now is going to make for a very interesting defense. Uh, there was an interview earlier on in the summer with John Kaminsky, and he's talking about, like, A-gap blitzes that they were working on, like uh, – playbook wise and on the mental side of it and you know that has me excited when especially when you talk about uh a guy like a uh michael walker who is already turning heads did i say I, something to caught your attention mike don't do it don't do it don't do it <laughs> don't do it yet because here's the thing let's <laughs> okay, so look, 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 let's let's bracket him. Let's put let's talk about Michael Walker for a second because I like what you're saying right now in the trenches right now, and I think mm-hmm. it's two more, it's two more points we want to make about the trenches really quick. Uh, one, like you said, I think it is it is good that you mentioned John Kaminsky from the perspective that Marlon Davidson right now is out with a knee strain, right? So yeah. for John, you know, for John Kaminsky, because like I said, we we said last week, Jr. We said okay, what really separates Marlon Davidson? You know what I mean? What separates a Marlon Davidson and a John Kaminsky right now? And like I said, it's not much. But right now, what separates them is reps, yep. knowledge, That's it. in the game. So right now, John Kaminsky, pound for pound ATL Nation, has a little bit of a jump right now on Marlon Davidson because he's getting those reps. He's familiar. Culture staff already knows what we can get out of that guy. So don't be shocked. A couple games, if you see a little bit more of John Kaminsky first, or you see Marlon Davidson as we work Marlon Davidson in. Okay. Now, Yep. But, with, no, but, with, but within that same thought, though, let me ask you this. I haven't heard Deidre Sinat's name one time. Nope. What's up, JR? What, you, what are you Well, okay, what, look, what? I did see, uh, you know, they've been throwing those clips out there. And somebody, it's funny that you said that I was going back up through chat because they're, they're pretty active right now. So I wanted to try to to make sure I was, wasn't missing nothing. And Jordan Daniel said we got uh, Mariner and uh, Sinat yes. as well, right? Now, well, I haven't seen right. Yeah. I haven't seen much about Mariner, but I did see a play where Sanat was you was clearly second team because you know because Shab was in at quarterback and uh, you know like when you see those clips that they put out, really pay attention to you know who's playing quarterback or you know who's running the ball or whatnot. It gives you a real good idea of of if you're watching first team or second team. And I saw Deidre Sanat really getting some pressure. You know, coming up in the middle and getting some pressure on uh, on uh, Matt Schaub at the time. So they're not talking about him yet. Hopefully he can, you know, make his way into this rotation. Because if not, man, that's going to be a wasted third round pick. And I don't like wasting anything from the fourth round up, you know, no. as far as draft capital goes. No. Uh, let's see. We're going to talk. Uh, 
Twisted TV said uh, Stephen Means uh, was cold doing some preseason games for us. Uh, yeah, true. So um, I did like you know he the few games that he got in for us before at the end of 2018, I think it was. Uh, he looked good, so I'm I'm excited to see how he looks coming back. Um, Richards said the NFL does not know what's coming for them, but we got to show up and prove it. Yep. Keanu Neal can't believe the hype without no results. Yep. That was a quote from Keanu Neal. Uh, yeah. let's see. Ah, Jimmy's joined us for the folks in the <laughs> chat. If y'all see down yonder sports, that is, uh, that is Mike's co-host Jimmy who decided to play, uh, tried to slack today and didn't want to join. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, he says Kaminsky ready to shock people and be a dog. His off season been crazy and he's quietly doing his job, ready to make some people feel his power. That's right. I think Kaminsky is going to be uh, a true force uh, in, in a, in a good way. You know, I think I love, I love it though. I love yeah, it. I think the, the mainstay of Grady Jarrett, Marlon Davidson, John Kaminsky and Dante Fowler, you know, yeah. that that's a core defensive line right there. Yeah. Because, and here's the thing. Let, let, let me be honest with you. And I, and I mean this. And like, here's the thing. Pound for pound. Listen, y'all might have agreed with us now, but disagree with me if you think different. But I think if you really want to know who I think our smartest defensive tackle is, it's John Kaminsky. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. But they're like smartest. What do you mean? Smarter than Grady Jarrett? Smarter than? I'll tell you why. John Kaminsky is a former quarterback. I always love former quarterbacks that outgrow their body and go to other positions. <laughs> right. Because... because their understanding of the entire game, because they have to worry about everybody, usually allows them to just see the game in, play, in ways that others aren't aren't able to see the game in certain ways. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I think that, you know, you look at quarterbacks that go to receiver or running back or converted guys from quarterbacks. Right, right, right. You always got to look after those guys because – they're gonna do every. They're gonna do all the little things necessary to continually get better. And I look for again. I look to hear Kaminsky's name a lot more. If at if at worst on a special team, I look at him to be a special teams leader. And I look at him to, like I said, surprise, make his presence known by no more than game three or four. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. I mean, I think, um, I think Kaminsky has has a chance to really submit himself. Uh, he really seems like a. Dan Quinn type guy, just hard nosed, hard worker, and and those are those ends up being those kind of guys. They may not be superstars in this league, but it's it's the, he's that type of guy that you turn around and go, man, he's been playing for fifteen years, or you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So you know, it's those type of guys that that you've got to have on your team. And so Absolutely. I'm really excited to see what his uh, what year two holds for for John Kaminsky. Um. Let's see. Anthony Wright says, "Jr. Mike, wouldn't you both agree that this is the deepest Falcons team on the O line, D line, secondary receivers, and running backs? On paper, I absolutely agree with you, Anthony. I don't think we've had what I would consider to be this caliber of talent from front to back in in quite a long, maybe since around 2012, when you had you know Tony Gonzalez and Roddy White and Julio Jones and." You know, those guys on there, even though I'm trying to remember if uh, Abraham was still on, on the team in 2012. We never really did have a stalwart defense. That's the part I'm really excited about, honestly, is the amount of talent that is on potentially on this defense. So, so, so Anthony Wright, great point. Great point because, and I, and I try not to get fired up because I'll tell you where, Let's focus on where we had the depth, right? If we have a NFL starter who started 50, 60 games in the league in James Carpenter, mm-hmm. and we're not mentioning him in terms of offensive line starter, right? On the on the offensive line, because hey, let's be honest, let's be humble, let's be humble, Falcons fans. You know, Wes Schweitzer. Uh, you know, um, like I said, I always forget the guy that went to Oregon State. What's the guy that went Talk to Oregon Sean State? Sean Harlow. Harlow, thank you. Thank you, JR. Harlow. Harlow. No, who, who would you like there? Who would you like in the trenches if an offensive lineman goes down? Look. If yeah. Hennessy or you know. Yeah, if I got my choice, I may not be a huge fan of James Carpenter, but, but I like that experience. I'm okay. We're not even right. gonna think about it. And at, and at the yep. safety position, let's be honest now. Let's be honest. I I thought I thought when JJ Wilcox before he got hurt and tore his ACL, I thought last year, I was like, oh my gosh, yes, got an extra safety. And we're going to need him, right? Because right. we always need those safeties. Yep. It has always been a colossal failure 
at the safety position for the Falcons. And I and I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. These are the most talented safeties because oh, if I cool. had to put hey, because here's the thing now. If I had to put if I had to put Thomas Deku and William Moore against the DeMonte Casey, Ricardo Allen, Keanu Neal, I'm taking DeMonte Casey, Ricardo Allen, Keanu Neal, because they will hit you, they will pick the ball off, and they are not they are they love the game of football. Let me mm-hmm. ask you something. When you watch Thomas Deku, did you, did you always think that he loved the game of football, or did you sometimes, think he would have... Sometimes I wondered if Deku even remembered that there was a game being played on Sunday. You got to tell him. You got to stop blowing dandelions. Yeah, right. You know? I and mean, look, I, I ain't got, look, I ain't got nothing against war. You know, Willie Moe always ready. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I got nothing against I got nothing against Willie Moe, but he was, I mean, how many times was he looking to take your head off versus <laughs> making the tackle? You know what I'm saying? You know? Yes. And, and yes. sometimes, look, that's fine. That's great. But sometimes that blows up in your face, you know? Man. And uh, yes. so, yes. yeah, it's it's definitely I, – I, I really like this safety group. And I think the this safety group was what made them feel comfortable about walking away from, you know, Desmond Trufant. Because you have a Ricardo Allen that can play corner and safety. You know, you have DeMonte Casey who played corner in college but who now plays safety. You know what I'm saying? So I think a lot of your coverage this year is going to come from that that big dime or big nickel and big dime packages just because of the experience, if nothing else. That's right. That's Let's right. see here. Let me head on back to the comment section for just um, – Jordan Daniel says, if you count the sacks Fowler got with the 16 tackles for loss – that's like 27 tackles in the backfield, uh, technically, which is mind blowing. See, for me, this is the part like everybody talks about wants to talk about sacks and sack numbers. I don't necessarily get like sacks are great, and I want sacks, but I'm also I just want to know how much my DNs are living in the backfield. I want to see tackles for loss. I want to see QB hits. I want to see QB yeah. hurries. Those kind of things tell me what type of defensive end. And those are the kind of things, those ancillary things are the things that Big Beasley never had. You know, he had his one year of 15 sacks, and that was great. But even in that year of 15 sacks, he didn't play in the backfield all that much. And that's so that's, that's the part point. that has me excited. That's the part that has me excited about uh, Dante Fowler. And that's the part that keeps me from just dogpiling on Tack McKinley. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. he hasn't necessarily put it together all the way, and I don't know if he will, mm-hmm. but he's at least very active in the backfield. And that makes me, you know, keep hope alive for Tack McKinley, I guess you could say. So so let me tell you something. Yeah. Okay. I predict, and I and again, it's completely off the cuff. I predict yeah, a at least an eight set year, eight to ten set year for Tack McKinley. I'll tell you, you what. Tack is down. 248 and weight yep. weight wise, right? Yep. He's got a, a lot a lot of um looks like like I said, he's got he's got a good nutritionist. Whoever is in charge of tax nutrition, shout out to you because right. y'all what finally I, got that boy eating, right? Thank you, you know, because tech looks like he is ripped, ready to go. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you something, man. Tech didn't struggle with motivation. Chat struggled with the drive sometimes that it took to be the absolute best. Sometimes he get distracted, sometimes he's he's spending more time going back and forth with fans than he would be in his playbook. And sometimes right. it showed because Tech always has been an effort guy. And Tech is what I call he was what I call an almost pro bowler because he would he he led the league in almost sacks. Almost sacks. Yeah. Come almost on. sack. Sack is a almost tech sack. Tech is an almost <laughs> sack artist. <laughs> sack guy. Sack <laughs> artist, right? But I think the extra weight loss, right? I think his motivation and if you look at him you know, and, and hey, it, we're all, you know, we're family guys, me and JR family guys. When you when you bring a kid into this world, sometimes things just click, right? Sometimes. Tosh Lupoy, you know what I mean? Working with talented defensive linemen, being able to get the most out of talented defensive linemen. Yep. Dante Fowler, another dog. If I'm a – man, I'm going to tell you like this. If if I'm a pit bull, right, uh-huh. and my job is to be a pit bull every day, and let's say I need a running mate, right, and I look at the dogs and I'm like, man, okay, um – you know, who's going to run with me today? And a collie comes up and y'all go run the neighborhood. A pit bull can't run the neighborhood with a collie. No. A pit bull needs another pit bull. You, know, right. you know what? You, 
You know what Tack has on the other side? He's got, pit bull. Yep, that's it. I think so, I think that's going to do more for Tack McKinley than anything else. I mean, it's already come out. Like, he had he he had an interview. I think the first time he had an interview since they declined his option. And he, he even, you know, he spoke about it. He wasn't, he didn't, wasn't bashful about it. He said that's that right. that was a big wake up call for him. Realized that, hey man, time's, time's flown. You're already entering your fourth area in the league. If you want to keep playing, you better step it up. And then, you know, he commented on uh, Dante Fowler showing him some things and really being, you know, a mentor for him. Like, we like to rag on Beasley, but Beasley just didn't have that alpha mentality. You could see that. It was just, True. it wasn't there. True. It just is what it is. And, and Tack McKinley seems like a guy who needs another alpha mentality pushing him. Well, now right. he's got it in Dante Fowler, who's already said that he's, you know, he's gunning for sack titles. He's, you know, he's as excited as you want him to be, you know, right. back playing with Dan Quinn and all this other stuff. So I'm hoping that it rubs off real well on a, on attack McKinley. That's right. Let's uh, jump back in here. It says, uh, oh, Fred Butts says, uh, DQ has been asking for a defensive lineman for years and he finally got it. Uh, but I think it's because of rich and that's possible. You know, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not going to lay it all at the feet of Rich McKay, but, I mean, that does so, seem like something that has. But that's it. But that's it. Yeah, good. I mean, I, I, <laughs> how could you not make that, that leap in logic? Rich McKay comes in as essentially now the president, and we start getting, making what I consider to be smart signings. So This is the this is the best draft. I honestly, Jay, to that point, this is the best draft we've had since the Super Bowl. All right. And, uh Whenever you're ready, whenever you're ready, because I know we, you know, we get we get passionate, we lose sight of time. Whenever you want to talk about Michael Walker, I'm ready because I, I'm. <laughs> we'll we'll circle I'm back ex- around to him because I'm excited All about right. that guy. I just I love that guy. <laughs> Let's see. B Strong it. says, uh, "Do you think our 2020 offensive defensive line can hold their own against the Ravens, Vikings, Steelers type of teams?" I think so, and we're gonna see it right out the gate with with the Seahawks. You know, so we're gonna see what this offensive line is about, but. Uh, but I think that I think that they can hold their own. Well, you know, obviously the proof is in the pudding. But you know, uh, Mr. CDX for Life says, huh, "My, I was temporarily put in as a defensive coordinator of a flag football team over the weekend, and I use <laughs> I use this slogan." Uh, he says, "See ball, get ball." That's right. That's what that's what we got. See ball, get ball. It's all that's what it's about. <laughs> always, always, always. Let's see. Kojak says. Uh, yeah, I think so. Rich McKay had a lot to do with uh, this all season drafts and pickups. You know, rise up exactly. Oh, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jocelyn says commented on your blowing dandelions comment about Deku there. <laughs> oh, let's see, let's see. I'm trying to keep up with chat here. Y'all are doing real good tonight, chat. I appreciate all y'all's comments. Um, let's see, let's see. Uh, Adam Holloway says, what's good guys? Uh, glad I got in here, uh, with you guys, uh, for the first time in a bit. Yeah. I'm glad to have you back there, Adam. He said, let's talk about the tight end position. Uh, what do we like behind Hurst? Jaden Graham, Pickney thoughts on this year's group. Boy, he just took through that. I wasn't expecting that. Talk about tight ends. Now I will say this. The one thing I'm somewhat concerned about, at least as far as the, like hype videos or, or uh, like clips that you see and come out of Falcons. I'm not hearing anybody talk about anybody behind Hayden Hurst. Like it doesn't seem like a Jaden Graham or a Jared Pickney or they re-signed Luke Stalker. So I don't know what that says about Kerry Lee that we signed from the XFL. Cause you figure you signed that guy to be your blocking tight end. And yeah. so if yeah. they brought back Stalker, I don't know if that means they weren't necessarily liking what they were seeing from Kerry Lee or what have you. But I right. think I did see a picture of of Pickney catching a pass from Matt Ryan. Right, right, so, right, right. Uh, what's yeah. your thoughts yeah. there? Well, well, and here's the thing, though. I, I think that um, – so great point. Thank you for bringing up the tight end. Right, yeah, no doubt. I, because, because I, actually, uh, I actually saw an interview – that Hayden Hurst did probably, I think it was today, today or yesterday, where okay. he basically, one, we just started at the top. We started at the top because I think at the tight end one position, Hayden Hurst stays healthy. 
we really have a chance to do something that we haven't seen since Tony Gonzalez, right. which is go a little bit vertical. Exactly. You know, and I like I like a vertical push because here's the thing, man. Hey, as Falcons fans, defensively, we have been killed by the vertical route from tight ends for years. Yeah. Since I've been born. So <laughs> but man, since, since so, I've been born. Since I've been born, we've been getting killed by the vertical route and the tight end, right? So we finally have a guy, and don't get me wrong, I love Tony G, Hall of Famer Tony G. Oh, yeah. Shout out to first ballot Hall of Famer Tony G. No doubt. But again, we got Tony G a little bit at the end of his career where he was there to be a glorified, amazing, awesome, reliable possession guy. Oh right? yeah, he was he was a uh chain mover, you know, right. blanket guy yeah. right there. And and that's great. And to be honest with you, Hayden Hurst is not Tony Gonzalez, but he has the ability to stretch the field and stretch the defense. We're golden there, right? But behind him, it does cause some concern, which is why I'm glad they brought the question up. Because here's the thing, man. If I'm a if I'm a guy, I'm still I like what I've seen out of Jaden Graham. He scored meaningful touchdowns in NFL games. I like it. I think he'll continue to get better. And the Falcons have him on the roster. Again, another guy from Yale that would do what as expected. He won't do a lot of things to screw himself up. So I think honestly, here's the thing. What it tells me is number one and number two, we know what we got. But Jaden Graham is not crap in the run blocking department. No. He's another pass catcher. Yeah, two yeah. Pass he's catcher. he's definitely a pass catcher. I think out of out of the Jaden Graham uh Jared Pickney uh combo, I think Pickney's got a better chance of solidifying cuz I think he's more of an all-around tight end, Absolutely. right? You know, as far as as um you know what what he can do. So unless Jaden Graham has just added you know blocking to his game this offseason, which I mean he could have been really working on that. You know, right. had he unless he added that to his game, um, uh, he might be sitting at you know tight end three, you know yeah, special absolutely. teams kind of guy, uh, which is fine. You know, but but right. yeah, he's he's definitely that that pass catcher. Looks like we got Toby D joining us in chat. Good deal. Oh, you, vacation. Toby. Thank you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry, oh, guys. Oh, oh, oh. Toby, Toby D, thank you for joining us on vacation. It's nice <laughs> to come into the chat and you know hang with us. You know for. Falcons fans love about our Dirty Birds. So wherever you are, Toby hey. D, I hope you're hope you're enjoying yourself. But uh, you know we're working hard. So just watch go. me and Gerald work. <laughs> That's right. Uh, okay, earlier on, well, I didn't get to the uh, to uh, mention or mention it early on, but uh, somebody early up in the chat said something about who are we feeling as far as tight end number or not tight end, but running back number two. And I gotta uh, I gotta say as far as Running back number two goes, I think it's Todd Gurley and the rest of them. I think it's a stable. I mean, if you look at, if you look at Dirk Cutter's years in Tampa, you know, when he had full control and he was doing his thing, he used four or five different running backs. I mean, he had Jaquiz Rogers. He had Peyton Barber. He had Charles Sims. He had, uh, oh man, there was another one. Anybody else that he could get his hands on, right? So he was mm-hmm. not against using three and four backs, and I continue to see him doing the same for sure. Like mm-hmm. if I think if you want to say who's you know RB two, I think RB two is definitely uh, Brian Hill. Like if you want to label it, I think at this junction. Um, but I think it's going to be Todd Gurley, and then whatever situation you got. Like, is it short yardage goal line? Bring me Quadre Olison. Is go. it is it third down and I need another receiving threat? Bring me Edo Smith. Is it, you know, second down and uh Todd Gurley needs a break? Then I think it's it's Brian Hill. You see what I'm saying? Like I don't think that it's gonna be a true R B one through four. I think they're going to and, keep all four of them, and I think it's going to be a situational well, type hey, statement. Hey, 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 and, and my thing about it is here. Like, listen, with the versatility that we have, having a Todd Gurley, who's a bigger back, because to be honest with you, we couldn't do this with maybe a Devontae Freeman because it's a little bit smaller back. But right. at the end of the day, you could you could see Matt Ryan back there, and you could see Todd Gurley on the left side, Edo Smith on the right side. That's right. You know, you utilizing their skill sets, because let us not forget, Todd Gurley is one. Hey, Falcons fans, you guys remember the, t- the touchdown Todd Gurley scored on us last year uh, when the Rams came into town? At the end of the day, he can catch the ball a little bit too. So That's right. I, I, I think when you look at who the number two running back is, it's not even anything you should worry about if Todd Gurley is healthy because at the end of the day, that is part of our secret weapon. 
We don't want to have a run. We don't. This is a year where I feel like if we don't have a running back too, we can still win games because all of the running backs that we've mentioned, all of the mention, all the running backs we've mentioned have proven themselves in NFL games. It's just a matter of That's using it. them at the right position at yep. the right time. I, I, I think, think we, I think a lot like how we use or we talk about the D line as being starters as being fluid. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the only like real starter you have is is Grady Jarrett. Everybody else mm-hmm. is just what we need at the time. I think that's right. right. I think that's what the running back situation is going to be in all honesty. I think Mm -hmm. it's going to be a true running back by committee, whatever the situation needs and calls for. And I think it gives us like the different versatilities of the running backs gives us a chance to do a bunch of different things. You know, you have the physicality of a Todd Gurley and a Quadre Olison. You have the quickness and uh, cutting ability of Edo Smith. I mean, it just gives you such right. a Swiss Army knife back That's behind right. Matt Ryan. I mean, I could easily envision a scenario where you have you run out on the field, like you said, with a Todd Gurley and a Edo Smith. But what if you ran out there with a Todd Gurley and a Quadre Olison and mm-hmm. use Quadre Olison as a lead back, or mm-hmm. or split Todd Gurley out into a five, you know, into a you know, yeah. uh, wide receiver Absolutely. like in a slot. You know what I'm saying? So there's absolutely. If, and this is the part that I was speaking on earlier, if Dirk Cutter can get creative, we have the pieces to make defenses hurt. We have the pieces to where somebody should always be open. I mean, if Hayden Hurst comes in and does what he's supposed to do, if Calvin Ridley takes the step that we're expecting him to make, if Russell Gage cements himself in the slot receiver position like he seems like he is doing. Ooh. You add all that with the like literal stable of running backs behind Matt Ryan, there shouldn't be a reason why we shouldn't be scoring, you know, 28, 30 points a game. So 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 two things. Two things. I really don't like to talk on the receivers long because I feel like they're a strength and oh, yeah. we kind of bore people. But there are a couple of things that I noticed about the receivers, and I'm glad you brought up Russell Gage. Glad you brought up Russell Gage because I think he was a guy that, you know, hey, this is a guy that didn't even receive an invite to the NFL combine, right? right. Yep. So he was a guy that obviously had to have a hell of a pro day to be able to, you know, basically get, you know, on somebody's radar. And they're like, wait, we overlooked this guy, which is great because it looks like he's a guy that's been overlooked his whole career, which is right. good because that, that's kind of the way he plays. He's a special team guy. He's nitty gritty. But if you really look back at some of the plays that Russell Gage has made, he has shown the ability to be, I, I can't even call him a, a poor man's Harry Douglas. I, I could call him almost a rich man, Harry Douglas, but I think their <laughs> games a little bit are a little bit similar with Russell Gage being a little bit more gritty than right. Harry Douglas. Harry, yep. Harry Douglas was, was amazing, but I think he could be as good as Harry Douglas was for us. I, I do believe that because I think that, um, Gage had is actually beating more talented receivers behind because you know, hey, Jimmy and I, we had one of our greatest debates when we talked about Russell Gage and <laughs> and, and Christian Blake, right? <laughs> but I think Christian Blake, honestly, Jimmy had a great point because Christian Blake is actually the more talented receiver, but Russell Gage seems to be more dialed in, more locked into what the coaches are asking him to do, and I, and, and I think that that will that'll be another kind of underheralded story that I continue to bear fruit because and, and that, it's something to right. watch, you know, it's something to watch Absolutely. for sure. Cause to, to date, I haven't heard much of anything come out of camp about Christian Blake. I haven't heard mm-hmm. much come out of camp about Laquan Treadwell. You right. know? And right. so, uh, these are, these are names that you're going to have to watch as we go, especially without any preseason this year. Right. You know, it's exactly. going to be real interesting to see what they decide to do and who they try to decide, who they try to stash on practice squads and, and what what for. Um, and, and, and one more thing, one more yeah, thing. Yeah. And it will, it, it will behoove me if I didn't say this because I, I hate talking about the guy. And one thing you guys know about me, Powerful Power ATL, by now, I don't like talking about Falcons with the last name Jones. There's nothing to talk about. <laughs> They're the best at what they do, right? <laughs> right. But I got to talk about the jet really quick. And I don't know about you guys. Maybe it's the jerseys. Maybe oh, it's the, the sway. Oh, man. Maybe maybe it's the offseason, JR. But, man, let me tell you something. I don't know what uh, – I can't speak about Boeing. I can't speak about Stryker. I can't speak about all these other jets. But let me talk about the, vet, the jet that we got in Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> that jet looks good. He looks a little bit Dude. faster. He looks fine-tuned. 
it looks a little bit faster. Like that breakaway speed that I've been seeing. <sighs> well, just, just I mean, this is the first first time in how many seasons that he hadn't had to have some kind of off season surgery. <laughs> Fix some shows. kind of toe, ankle, whatever, it, finger, you know. And, yeah. man, he is looking sharp. He is looking real good. Uh, he is looking like a, a fine-tuned Ferrari out there is what Love he it. is looking like. And Love it. I don't know. I think, I think them jerseys have a lot to do with it. I know, <laughs> I know them folks, everybody was hating when they first came out, but the more I see them things moving and the more I see them things in action, boy, them things are – we look well, like a different team. Man, like come on. Team. And you know what? It ain't no superpower in the jersey. Because no. like I said, it's about, the, it's about the man inside of the jersey. But in the words of Dion, you know what we say. You look That's good. It. You look good. You play good. good. That's it. And you play good. You stay good. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So we got uh, my comment about Quadre Olison blocking for Todd Gurley has apparently sparked off uh, people talking about Keith Smith and uh, Mikey <laughs> Daniels. <laughs> I didn't know we was going to have a, a fullback conversation on, on oh, pound for pound, God. but, you know, we'll yeah. talk about whatever y'all want to talk about, chat. That's that's how we roll. That's but right. uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see if Mikey Daniels can supplant Keith Smith uh, in the fullback position. And I think it will be a lot more to do with, like, what, what they bring to the table on the uh, special team side. But I've heard nothing but good things from Mike, you know, coming out about Mikey Daniels. So I'll be interested to see – what the final 53 looks like. Uh, Victor says, we know Fowler, uh, we know Fowler in the edge and Grady in the middle. And oh yeah, wait until the coaches see what, what Walker can do (laughs) off the edge. I'm telling you flat out, flat out. Walker is going to potentially be a better version of Devondre Campbell when it's all said and done. When I went back and watched his, his tape at Fresno State, that dude can, as far as that, that front seven goes, he could play any one of the, not, I say anyone, obviously not the D tackles, but he looked good coming off the edge, and he looks good at linebacker. And he's already had, what, a couple interceptions off those tip drills? So I'm super excited to see what, what Michael Walker can bring so, to the table. So, 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 so I, I'm, and you know, we had to talk about him. We ain't got long. <laughs> We, we ain't got a long time. No, hey, no. <laughs> and I, I'm gonna be bold. I'm gonna end bold. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make y'all like, well, you know, Michael. You know, I've been, you've been, we've been doing good. But you, 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 this comparison you about to give to Michael Walker is crazy. We keep trying to compare him as a bunch of camel replacement. But there's actually a linebacker that I think his game, his two linebackers that his game reminds me of. Okay, who you Just got? That thumper because he can play inside. Because that, to be honest with you, I think he could be our de facto pass rusher as well. Two is we've seen it all, and I think it's two linebackers. One is is best case scenario. Uh, excuse me. One is the most likely scenario, and that's C.J. Mosley. Okay. I think he play, plays like a C.J. Mosley because he's a thick linebacker, big body linebacker, and when they put their hands on you, you stop. Right. The other linebacker that I think that he could be at his best case is one of the greatest linebackers I've seen in the last ten years, which is Bobby Wagner Ooh. for the Seattle Seahawks. Okay. And I think I think that ultimately, to be honest with you, if athleticism wins out by game eight or nine, here's the thing. Boye is a smarter player. Right. Michael Walker is a player that no matter they want to make him and bring him along slow, but he is going to hit somebody so hard one time that we're going to say, we got to keep putting this guy on the field. Mark it. Yeah. The reason why I keep bringing up your Devondre Campbell, like replacement, right. Is because yeah. I think at what you saw out of Raheem Morris this past season, when, when he took over in that second eight games, he used Devondre Campbell as like almost like a, a hybrid right. player. You know, he, right. he walked him down closer to the line. You know, he rushed him off the edge quite a bit, sent him on blitzes, and then mm-hmm. he would also drop him into coverage to cover, you know, tight ends or running backs or whatnot. So that's why that's why I keep bringing that up because I think that that's the role that he's going to carve out early in, in, this, in his career. Now, he could easily supplant, you know, Foyer, you know, as far as his athleticism and everything else. But I think early on in his career, he's going to uh, be that that blitzing linebacker coming off the edge. All right, we're going to run through some chat real quick. We are, we're we a little bit past an hour, so we're going to try to blitzkrieg this and, and get some of these comments in. Uh, Jack says, when DQ relinquished play calling, uh, Jeff Ulbrich had his first and second down, Morris had third. Now Morris is named coordinator. Will he call every down or will Ulbrich call plays? I think 
Morris is going to call all your plays. I think Ulbrich's going to be heavily involved in the planning. But I think Raheem Morris has been a DC. He's been a HC. I don't think Raheem Morris needs any help uh, as far as that goes. Uh, Brandon Lee says, what about Alameda Zacchaeus? He's looking good in camp. Good, he's, yeah. a, he's another yeah. one that that right. they're battling for. You know, receivers mm-hmm. as deep as it's been in a while. Right. So, uh, let's see. Charlton Nash says, uh, let the man talk about Walker. Okay, we just did that. Uh, Jimmy says, show's on fire. Y'all getting me fired up. Well, good, Jimmy. Y'all should have a good show on Saturday then. And uh, y'all make sure y'all check back on the channel on Saturday to, to check out that show. Uh, right. Corey says, AJ Terrell is going to be battle tested all training camp. Uh, week one, he's going to be eating Seattle's plate. Uh, Falcons should play a lot of man to man and let Keanu roam and find targets to destroy. I am definitely encouraged by what I'm seeing from AJ Terrell. You know, he is not backing down. He is not uh, shy at all about showing his swag, showing, going after Julio Jones, going after Calvin Ridley. You know, getting beat, but getting, yeah, and but doing some beating as well. So, absolutely. absolutely. You know, I am. I'm thoroughly encouraged by what I'm seeing coming out about AJ Terrell. Uh, Jordan says uh, Walker going to be uh, sick. Campbell's Campbell's replacement, but better. I think Walker has a higher ceiling than Campbell. So Absolutely. it'd be interesting to see how it turns out. Anthony Wright says, I will say Falcons nation that the Aints uh, are on the decline and with a 43 year old quarterback. Yeah. I mean, look, they ain't got much more left in them. That much is for sure, you know. Yeah. Between them and Tampa, you know, we got we got geriatric central uh, in, in half this league. <laughs> uh, yeah. Speed Falcon for life. Oh shoot! What's up, Speed? I didn't see you in here. Cool. He says, "Do you think Chris List Lindstrom can be a top three guard in this league? I think he has the technique and the work ethic to be. So we'll see how it pans out. At this point, it'll just be can he stay healthy? You know." Uh, all right. Let's see. Da, 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 da. We are winning the division. All right. I'm going to pull a few more. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Well, y'all are really killing it tonight. Uh, stick. Steve says, uh, checking in all the way from South America. Holy crap. All right. Cool, man. Rock on. That's a uh, glad to glad you rise decided up, to man. join us. Yeah. yeah rise, rise up. Rise up. <laughs> um, all right. Wallace Smith says Foyer will be starting besides Dion. Yeah, I think to begin with, for hey, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. This is right. as usual. I think we are about five minutes over our hour mark. I normally try to cut us off in an hour, but the chat was moving too good to, to cut us off. But let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. Mike, I appreciate you jumping in uh, in place of Toby this Bless. week. It was a good, good talk. Good, uh, good show tonight. As okay. always, folks, y'all can catch us on here every Tuesday night live streaming. Uh, Jimmy and Mike, they put out their show on Saturdays. Definitely make sure y'all check those out. Those guys get, those guys get passionate and absolutely mm-hmm. enjoy their show, enjoy the things that Jimmy has to say. Uh, <laughs> and we're planning on doing some more four people uh, shows. I, I think I figured out the technical difficulty, so that hopefully we won't have that from, from – uh, <laughs> from last week speeds over here crying because i'm wrapping up the show <laughs> i'm sorry speed i gotta go put gotta my little go. girl to bed <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah. i gotta wrap right, this right, up right, right. but anyway now y'all can always hit us on twitter i'm at grim 1128 he's a uh, mike underscore doug you see the names on the on the uh screen there hit us up there uh but yeah that's what i got mike any final thoughts from you Pleasure. I, I I hate I hate that we couldn't do it longer, but uh, like I said, we here for a short time, not a long time. Love y'all, pound for pound nation. Right. Y'all always show out and listen, man. We you know we had Montreal, we got South America, oh, we yeah, got man. Australia, we got UK. Y'all keep tapping in because That's y'all give us the fuel to keep doing this. We That's in the same it. family. We we locked in on with y'all. We y'all That's might not it. see us, but we are locked in on with y'all as brothers and rise up nation. That's so it. we appreciate y'all. Another week, Jr. Take them home, baby. All right, man. Well, as always, Falcons fans. Rise up. Rise up, baby. Sir. Dude, that was a good show.